Amen. You can take your seats. All righty. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ross. It's good to see you downtown on the occasions that I get to be down here. And I'd also just like to say what's up to the people at West who are streaming this morning. I know they'll be sitting there in their regular posture without any sort of emotional reflection taking place right now. But I see you, well I don't, but you see me, um, and it's good to be able to share the word with you this morning. We are in the middle of a systematic study of the Gospel of Matthew. We've been going verse by verse, line by line, idea by idea, through this incredible account of the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. He is the blazing center of all that we believe. And so spending a long period of time examining a recording of his life and his teaching is so worthwhile. So if you're wondering, why are we going so slowly through this? Well, we can't get enough of Jesus, literally. We wanna hang on his every word. We wanna examine everything that he did and taught in detail because he is right at the middle of our faith. Matthew, who's been the scribe recording the accounts of Jesus' life, he has a theme, right? And his most prominent theme by far is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He uses these terms interchangeably. And so, so far in the gospel, he's been saying these things about the kingdom of God. He's been saying that it is near that it's at hand, that it's not just something you wait for when you die. The kingdom of heaven isn't just literally heaven. The kingdom of hand is something that is tangible where Jesus is and where Jesus' people are. And, and that the nearness, the reality of that kingdom was ushered in in the era of Jesus walking on the earth and now is at hand in the lives of his followers. He's also been saying, but wait, this kingdom is the opposite of what you expect. It's the opposite of every worldly kingdom. And so it's close, you can experience it, but you've gotta be looking for different things. Because it's not gonna look like a nation, it's not gonna look like imperial power, it's not gonna look like rule and reign over other peoples the way that we view a powerful kingdom in this world. It's gonna be for those who are poor in spirit, they're gonna be the ones who are blessed. It's gonna be for those who mourn, it's gonna be for those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's gonna be for the merciful, the pure, those who are mocked and hated for righteousness sakes. Those are gonna be the ones who lead in the kingdom of heaven. Because in this kingdom, the last will be first. The first will be last. Those who lower themselves will be exalted and kids will lead the way, which by the way is a very narrow way, much too narrow for self-righteous folk to be able to stay on. The last thing that Matthew's been telling us about this kingdom is that it has a king. And that king arrived in the world in the person of Jesus. And so Matthew has been showing us through the first 11 chapters, look who he is. He, he showed us through the prophecies. He, he showed us through the authority of his teaching. He's been showing us through a series of miracles. Jesus is no mere man. He is a king of a kingdom and that kingdom is at hand if you are prepared to upend your life and live a totally different way. And so Matthew offers us this description of and a repeat invitation to a life that is different to the rest of society, a life in the kingdom of God. He wants us to know what it is like and he wants to make sure, listen, that we don't miss the opportunity to live in its fullness. And so in the text that Harlem taught last week, the, the last verse was that contains this incredible statement, this remarkable thing that Jesus says in response to the imprisonment and subsequent uh, doubting of his friend and distant relative, John the Baptist. And Jesus you know, kind of says this incredible thing about John relative to the kingdom of God. Look what he says, verse 11 of Matthew 11. He says, truly I say to you, amongst those born of women, which means everyone, right? Amongst everyone who's ever lived, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, right? That is quite an acclaim from someone who knows everyone who has ever lived, right? Yet, the one who is least, where? In the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's no one greater than John the Baptist except for everyone 
in the kingdom of heaven, they're all greater than him. What an incredible thing to say. What a promise to the people of the kingdom that when it comes to the level of righteousness that a person can attain through their own obedience in this life, John is the best, game over, don't even try compete, right? He, he, he wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey, which wasn't like Cato before Cato was sexy, it was just like he was a wild man living in the desert, denying himself every earthly pleasure so that he could pursue God and his law. He did it better than anyone else, but those who are going to see what Jesus is going to do on the cross and those who will get to believe in the good news of the resurrection will bypass even John by experiencing the fullness of God's plan and the revelation of God's grace. Friends, that's you and me. Even the weakest, even the least in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John the Baptist. And so the first observation that we get into this morning before we even dive into the text is this one. The invitation to the kingdom. The invitation to the kingdom. And and the kingdom's not just a once-off moment, right? That gets you in, but there's a daily invitation to live a kingdom life. You can live according to the kingdom of this world or according to the kingdom of heaven. There's this ongoing invitation to live a different way. And the invitation to the kingdom is an invitation to greatness to greatness. Now, if you recognize some of this greatness language and you are nervous, don't worry. We haven't suddenly become a health and wealth and prosperity church, all right? Just chill, it's okay. That's not the message today. God wants you to be great, therefore he wants you to be loaded. And by the way, can you give all of the money that he gives you in your greatness to me? Because God also wants me to be great, which means God wants me to be loaded as will be evidenced by the fly clothes that I wear in front of you guys week in and week out. That's not where we're going with this thing. Let me just set a low bar on that. I bought these at Costco. (laughs) They were $19.99 and I couldn't resist them because they have memory foam in the bottom (laughs) and they placed them right between the little stalls where they had specials going on meatballs and 25 pound bags of shrimp. (laughs) It was the most genius marketing campaign ever. They went, how can we get suburban dads who have given up on life to buy these shoes, put them with the shrimp, right? And there was just a line of us standing there with boxes of shoes under our arms, eating shrimp, going like, yeah, this is, this is smart, they got me, right? Cheersing each other with a meatball, right? To suburban dadhood um, and to Costco, who they, I just feel like they see me, all right? And so friends, that's not what we're trying to do, right? When I speak of greatness, clearly we are not measuring by the world's standards. As we have already said, the Sermon on the Mount turns our understanding of greatness on its head. But Jesus says, and let's take him at his word, that even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Friends, I feel like I'm the least in the kingdom of heaven most days. And what that can do to my posture is make me kind of miserable, right? Jesus goes, you get into the kingdom of heaven? You get to see greater things than John the Baptist got to see. Lift your head, son. This is an astonishing truth. But how can I be greater than John? I feel dirty just saying it. This is one of the most committed people to have ever lived and I'm not like that. How can I achieve a level of spiritual greatness beyond what John got to see? What a crazy claim, how? Well, we get to experience the fullness of living with greater righteousness than John ever experienced. Not through our own obedience, but through Christ's obedience on our behalf. When they cut John's head off, Jesus had yet to go to the cross. And so John's righteousness of his own behavior was still as high as he got to experience righteousness in this life. We get to experience Christ's righteousness gifted to us saying, here, take this, that makes us greater in terms of righteousness than John the Baptist. We have a greater understanding than he did. He knew the scriptures, we should imitate him in his understanding of the scriptures, but he pointed forward to a change in redemptive history. We get to look back at how Christ fulfilled it. John the Baptist Bible didn't have a New Testament. He didn't get to see the full unfolding of redemptive history that we've got to see. What a privilege for us. And listen, this is key. We get to experience, listen, 
a greater power even than John the Baptist ever got to experience. You know that? We live post Pentecost. We live post the fulfilling of the promise that Joel made that the spirit would be poured out into ordinary people and they would do extraordinary things by the power of that spirit. We get to live with the promise of the spirit in us in a way that John never got to see. Friends, we really do live beneath our privileges, do we not? The invitation to the kingdom of heaven is an invitation to greatness. John pointed forward to it and hoped you and I get to actually live the reality of its coming. And so Jesus in this moment is carefully rooting his hearers in their grand redemptive moment in, in history. And John stands right in the middle of the divide of the old and the new covenants, right there. Now T.W. Manson said in many ways, John is like Moses because he brought the people of Israel to the outskirts of the promised land, but did not enter the land of rest himself. We get to enter that land. Takumbo Adoyemo said, yet despite John's greatness, believers are greater than John. I love this image, look at this, this image. For it is as if John stands back, holding open the door, so that believers may enter. John holds the door for us as we step into the possibility of kingdom life. This ought to adjust our posture just a little bit, right? This ought to increase our enthusiasm just a smidgen. It ought to stir our affections and move our hearts. We so often persuade ourselves in Christianity that the life of following Christ is a less than life that to live it fully would be to miss out on a life of potential greatness. Jesus is like, the life of the kingdom is the greatest life. Follow me in it. This is the greatest you can be. But with great power comes great responsibility. I heard that somewhere once. And so Jesus warns them that this tremendous greatness on offer isn't something to be flippant or aloof about, or cool, or dismissive with. It comes with this responsibility, and so look at what Jesus warns in verse 12. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Jesus just tied your Old and New Testament together, you're welcome, right? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now scholars aren't exactly sure all that Jesus is referring to here because he actually uses some words that aren't used anywhere else in the New Testament. So we must acknowledge our limitation in understanding some of the things that are sometimes said. As a result, it could be rightly concluded either that Jesus is saying that the kingdom is advancing through a violent and forceful grabbing of it, or he could be saying that the kingdom is being opposed through violence and force. I think both of those things are true, but I like the first explanation because it ties in with what's going to follow and it connects with what comes before it and it connects with the main point that Jesus is actually making in verse 13 and 14. Here's Jesus' main point in verse 13 and 14. John is like Elijah. And you might go like, that's not a very significant point for me this morning, Pastor. Thanks very much. I got out of bed early. Um, John is like Elijah. How does that help me? Well, the second last verse of the, of the Old Testament says this in Malachi 4. It says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Jesus is going, ding, ding, ding. The great and awesome day of the Lord has arrived in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Step into the kingdom. Step into the greatness that's available for you. I am the king, the one that Elijah came to point to. That's why he says, if you've got ears, listen, don't miss it. The king of the universe, the one you have been waiting for, the meaning in and behind everything is standing right in front of you. Take hold, grab on, don't sit back, don't be passive, grab the kingdom and all of its life available to you. Don't stand off and be aloof. Tim Keller, when teaching on this text said, and just by the way, 
I'm very impressed that I found this quote because this is gonna be Tim Keller quoting Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which in preaching circles is like the Hall of Fame, right? I should be carried off on lifted hands because if you can manage to quote Keller and, Sir, uh, and Spurgeon in a sermon, you are one of the greatest Baptists who've ever lived. You quote Keller quoting Spurgeon? I, I, don't, I don't even know they have a category for that, right? But we found this, look at this. Jesus says that there's a certain kind of relentlessness, a certain kind of hard pursuit, a certain kind of striving, a spiritual intensity that must characterize anyone who will lay hold of the kingdom of God. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is saying, guys, I'm the king. This kingdom's available. Greatness is on offer. Take hold of it by force if necessary. Grab it, right? Now, when encountering a counter argument that rightly says we don't enter the kingdom by our own striving, Keller continues. He says, how do you know though that God's spirit is working in you? Here's how you know. You get spiritually violent. As Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher said, the way you know the spirit of God is striving with you is that you are striving too. Of course, the only, only the spirit of God can come and open your heart. You do not win the kingdom of God by your striving. But if the kingdom of God is something you're dealing with, if you are truly dealing with the truth, if you are truly listening to the message like John the Baptist, you will become a wild man slash woman of the kingdom, right? That if we get the glory of the king and the greatness of the life on offer, we will grab it with everything we have and we will pursue it with our whole lives. Now listen, we said last week that Jesus is able to deal with our doubts. We saw that, right? We saw that in his dealing with John the Baptist. You can have moments of doubt and still live in the kingdom. But here's the warning. You cannot have ongoing apathy and indifference and cynicism towards the kingdom life and towards the king who offers you that kingdom life and expect to live in the greatness of the kingdom life of heaven, you've gotta grab it. You've gotta take hold of it, you see, because the invitation to the kingdom is an invitation to greatness and the invitation to the kingdom is an invitation away from apathy. You cannot just stand aloof on the sidelines. You miss out on the kingdom of God when you try to stay cool while living close to the reality of the kingdom, hoping you'll catch it somehow, just enough of it to get you through on the last day while still living a cool life in this one. Now Jesus is gonna make this really clear for us. He goes on to warn that many in his generation were doing exactly this, that the kingdom was manifesting right in front of them and they were standing back going like, I don't know, Uh, let's see. I I love this text because look at Jesus' explanation, look at this mode of teaching. He picks children's games to explain it. So here's what he says. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Now how many of you have read that verse in a devotional before and gone like, I mean, all right. I'm sure it means something, all right? Next verse, all right? This sounds really strange to our sensibilities and I get it, there's a lot going on here that is from a time and a culture that is very different to ours. But Jesus here compares his generation to the popular children's games of the day. Don't you love that? It reads as abstract and high sounding philosophy to us, but literally what he was doing was taking the most basic and everyday and childlike illustration possible and using that to teach people. He was using something that even children could understand. Uh, my son Daniel turned nine a little while ago and he had a Pokemon party, right, okay? Uh, yeah, I know, I'm gonna get emails now that my son's given over to the occult, it's fine. Um, <laughs> It's all right, okay? Um, and uh, he had this Pokemon party and all these kids were gathered around. And, I, and the thought crossed my mind because I knew this text was coming up. This would be like me standing up and saying, children, the kingdom of heaven is like Pokemon sword, right? And all the nine-year-old boys and some 25-year-old boys would lean in, right? 
because they'd be like, yes, tell me more. How do I finish that game? That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He isn't afraid to associate with the lowly. He takes an example of an everyday occurrence in a Middle Eastern village. Parents would come to the marketplace to trade um, uh, or or to make their daily purchases uh, before refrigeration, and they would leave their kids with other kids in the market square, right? And so there wasn't childcare, any of that kind of thing. It was a communal living, and so kids, you go play with the other kids in the market square, Um, your parents will be back later. And so it's before tablets, it's before electricity for that matter, and so the games were simpler. And so a common make-believe game for children to play was then for, to, for them to imitate two of the most common adult things they saw, weddings and funerals. And so one of the kids would play the flute. You see the recorder has gone back in time as an instrument of torture. Um, it's always been with us. And so one of them would play the flute, um, which is a terrible choice of instrument. I don't know why um, they didn't have an acoustic guitar, but one of them plays the flute and they would either play a party kind of wedding song and then all the kids would do a party kind of wedding dance. Now, if you're not sure what a party kind of wedding dance is, it's like Gangnam Style or um, YMCA with your tire wrapped around your head at two in the morning when you should have gone home a while ago. That's the standard wedding dance. It has been um, for generations, right? And so that's what kids would would imitate there. Or the kids would play a very sad song on the flute, which for me is pretty much any song on the flute. And that would be an opportunity for them to imitate public mourning because mourning was very public in that day. It wasn't like our memorial services today where everyone tries not to cry. It was like someone has died. And so the whole village cries publicly. And so kids saw these interactions happening every day. And so it was like ancient Simon says, right? Play the happy song, everyone dances. Play the sad song, everyone looks super sad. But some of these kids wouldn't participate because they were the cool and aloof non-joiner kids of their day. Now I have a condition. I am a chronic non-joiner. It's something that has afflicted me from my youth. I don't dance when others dance. I believe that's for their benefit, but it's also for mine. I don't take part in new activities when people have new activities. In team building, I'm like, I'm injured, I'm old, I'm, I'm, I'm unavailable, right? Like it's just, I just stand back and watch things happen, but I hate it about myself. And Jesus said, his generation is like the non-joiner cool kids who wanna be in with all the other kids, but don't wanna look like fools, and so they sit back and they refuse to participate in the game of the day. And Jesus is saying, that, that is missing out on kingdom life. Doubt I can deal with. Apathy, no, no. Apathy gets you to miss this life that's on offer. Here's how he goes on to explain it. He says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet, wisdom is justified by her deeds. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying you can't win with people who want to control everything. John the Baptist comes fasting, calling for repentance. They're like, demon. Jesus comes drinking, eating, enjoying, being with sinners. They're like, sinner. And he's like, well, which one would you like? And those who are cool and aloof stand off and say, actually neither, actually neither. My two kids play on our our trampoline every day. Um, That's what I pay insurance for. Um, And uh, my my daughter Katie is five, she calls it the the jumpoline. Um, And and she has a game that she likes to play where she can sing a song and Daniel, her nine-year-old brother, must just dance, right? It's just like dance, little monkey brother. uh, he occasionally gets fed up with this um, because he's starting to get to that age where he's starting to realize this really isn't cool and if one of my friends see me doing this, it's gonna be super weird. So he normally plays along, but then at a point he stops. And so he, a couple of days ago, we hear the scream coming out of the garden, a guttural cry um, that leads me to believe that one of my children has literally been broken in half. Um, and so I put the kettle on um, and sat and thought about my options for a little bit and then um, uh, uh, eventually went out, right? I mean, because they have been broken in half, there's not much you can do, right? So just, so don't judge me. Uh, and so, 
I took a while, but then I went outside and no one had been broken in half. What I saw was Daniel in the fetal position, all right? It was like a Stranger Things episode, um, sitting in the corner of the jumpoline and Katie also in the fetal position, but facing the other direction in the other corner of the jumpoline, kind of all, all wrapped up and they were both just losing it. And I'm like, what is going on? And, and, and Daniel's like, I just don't want to play anymore, Dad. This is so lame. Katie keeps trying to control me. So I'm like, Katie, what's going on? She says, Daniel won't do what I tell him. So I was like, it's a good life lesson, okay. What do you want him to do? And she says, from the bottom of her heart, with all the courage she can muster, I don't know, <laughs> but he won't do it. <laughs> Friends, this is Jesus' example of how culturally, listen, religious people miss out on the kingdom life because wherever they see it live to its fullness, they reject it because they don't want either of those things. When John calls for a funeral of repentance and holiness, they're like, no, crazy, that's judgmental. When Jesus lives in the freedom of the life in the spirit, they go, no, that's kind of extremism. I wanna live more moderate than that. And they sit back aloof, trying to manage their own coolness and they miss the kingdom of heaven. And we think if we would just be a bit cooler, culture would finally get the kingdom. No, if we would just live with the fullness of the kingdom, maybe culture would finally get the kingdom. Friends, John called people to a funeral and many in his generation said, we won't go. Jesus called people to a wedding and many in his generation said, we don't dance. And they missed. So let me wrap this up. The invitation to the kingdom is an invitation to a life of repentance. John teaches us this very, very clearly. He showed us this way, but that his generation were aloof to it. He lived an ongoing life of repentance, a life of protest, a life showing the sin and folly of the culture. And what did they say about him? They called him a demon. They were aloof to his call and wouldn't mourn their sin when he sounded the sound of a funeral dirge. They said, we won't weep. Friends, just stick with me. Many of us are like this. We look at the possibility of a life in the kingdom, but as soon as it calls for us to repent, as soon as it calls for us to lay down our sin, our desires, our comforts, our reputations, we're like, I'm out, That's, that's crazy. That's too much. That's, no, that's, no, no. I think God just wants me to be happy. He doesn't want me to mourn anything about me or what I do. None of the kingdom life is a life of repentance. It has funerals in it. It's a death to self. Friends, I do this and I have done this. I sometimes still do this. When I'm missing out on the joy and the power and the fruit of the kingdom in my life, sometimes I stop and look and realize, oh, I've been called to repent of a bunch of stuff and I said no, because I thought it would take away my joy when actually it was a call right into the middle of kingdom life. I dial back hoping to protect my reputation. But one of the things that I've learned in my walk with Jesus is that you can repent or defend your reputation, but the two are pretty much mutually exclusive. The kingdom life is a life of joyful, willing repentance, saying our ways have been foolish, God, we desire your ways. Some of us are like a person who doesn't mourn at a funeral, thinking they can stuff it down and appear in control and getting massively caught out by grief (laughs) later on. Or so, the invitation to the kingdom is an invitation to a life of freedom. This great life is a life of, of freedom like Christ lived. He was the freest man who ever lived. Jesus showed them this way, but they didn't know what to do with it, right? The religious folks of the day, the culturally religious went like, I don't know what to do with that measure of freedom. Like he gets filled by the spirit and then does whatever the spirit tells him to do. I don't think so. Let's build a theology that says that can't be right because that looks crazy free. And so they stand aloof and away from this and they miss the kingdom. 
He showed them what it looked like to live with this freedom of a life sold out to the kingdom cause and they accused him of being a drunkard and a glutton. You see how like children we can be? We don't want the rigidity of John, (laughs) but we don't know what to do with the freedom of Jesus. We don't know how to engage with it. So we stand off to the side trying to observe it passively. I need to discover that when we miss the fullness of joy that Christ offers us, it's because we have chosen to not lay hold of the kingdom life he extended towards us. Friends, some implications for today and then I'm out of your hair. First implication is for you if you're a believer. The second implication is for you as you share your faith with your friends who are not yet believers. Some of you in this room today are Christians, but you have cool and aloof hearts. You may be culturally Christian, but you're not living a life that is kingdom minded. This may be because you're too self-righteous to live a life of repentance. This may be because you are too self-sufficient to live a life of sold out Christ-like freedom. Turn your hearts today grab hold of the kingdom we're gonna sing in a second don't just don't be passive just don't just make a decision I'm gonna grab hold of these truths available to me today and I'm gonna let my heart catch up don't stand coolly aside while the music plays (laughs) you've been offered a life of greatness in the kingdom grab it secondly I just want to give us a warning as we engage with our surrounding cultural moments, as we share the gospel, I hope and pray that you are faithful and constant evangelists and that you are sharing the gospel because we have the greatest news to share. Let's do that, but let's be wise. Here's where I worry, particularly for younger generations. I hear this argument a lot. Let us understand the limitations that we have. We will never, listen, be able to make the gospel into the perfect package of acceptability to the culture. You can't. We must try, we must be sensitive, we must be kind, we must be smart, we must be thoughtful, but you can't package it perfectly. Listen, no one was better at embodying the gospel than Jesus. You can't out Jesus, Jesus, and people rejected him. And so I I hear this a lot today, like, oh, I'm done with the church. We just need to live a life really like Christ. Then the world will really see what Jesus was like, like, No, they didn't see it when he was actually here doing that. And so live in some of the freedom of like, I'm just gonna follow him and I'm gonna share it as much as I can and I'm gonna live as godly as I can and I'm gonna leave the results to him. Some of your friends will reject the message because it requires repentance, it's okay. Some of your friends will reject the message um, because it gives a freedom of grace in a kingdom life they can't get their head around. Pray for the Holy Spirit to give them eyes to see. And don't try to be cooler than Jesus. Let's keep inviting people into the greatness of kingdom life. Let's make sure though, that we ourselves live it out by rejecting apathy and coolness and aloofness and cynicism in the name of cultural connectivity. You know what the world needs to see? Christians who dance when the flute starts playing the wedding song. Christians who mourn at sin and who turn from it in their daily lives. Don't be cool. Rather live a life passionate for the kingdom because as Jesus promised, wisdom is justified by her deeds. The kingdom will be shown to be the wise way and passionately pursuing our king will be shown in time to be the wisest way you can live, start today. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you do what I could not possibly do, which is to take this word and to put it in people's hearts and to do something with it. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would do just that. 
that you would take this living and active and true and powerful word and sink it into our hearts. I pray for those in the room this morning who don't yet know you. I pray that they would feel drawn by your grace, by this offer of a kingdom. And I pray that they would seek you out today and that you would take hold of them. I pray for those, Father, who do know you. The truth be told, their hearts have grown cold towards you and towards your things. This might be because they missed an opportunity to repent. This might be because they missed an opportunity to rejoice. I pray that they take those opportunities today. And that Holy Spirit, you stir up something in this group of nobodies that shows that this kingdom life is the greatest life we could ever live. Help us to live it in Jesus' name.